17. This is kind of amazing that we've come this far in the year. Uh, it's pretty exciting. So welcome, everybody. Thank you again for joining. So today here in Buelo, it was 17 degrees Celsius. Man, the last three days have been super balmy. It's been over 24 degrees Celsius for three days. And at 75 degrees Fahrenheit, it's feeling like, like it was back in summer. So absolutely incredible. So I want to say hello, peaches and sugar from uh, Valley of Nova Scotia. Welcome. So the first freezes have come. Uh, they came last week and the early part of this past week. So we got minus two, minus three, and that pretty much took out the gardens. Uh, it took everything out. So we've been busy harvesting. On Monday, we harvested the last of our rutabagas and parsnips so we could get those in for our long preservation, which we're going to talk about tonight. Also, today we did our last real big harvest. We harvested the last of our chicories, which is our green radicchios. We harvested the last of our leeks, uh, which is great. We all love eating leeks. We harvested greens. We harvested bunches of kale. We're still going to have some lettuces and kales out in the field, probably all the way through the end of the month. So that's quite fun. Um, but it is the time of year where we do harvest a little bit extra and put it in the cool room or put it in our fridge because it's always nice to have those extra bunches of kale because you never know if the temperatures are just going to turn or if the rains come in and then it gets cold and then the mildews just come in and just take it, take the kale out for good. So uh, we kind of keep on top of that. The last of the turnips, the, the winter radishes like daikon and black radish, all of those things we're going to talk about tonight. Uh, so now we're starting to think about settling to our sort of the end of the season routine. We really enjoy this time where the nights are delving deeper. We spend more time with our cats. We spend more time uh, cooking. We spend uh, more time doing the things we enjoy, like reading and listening to more music and doing puzzles. I don't know if people out there like to do puzzles. Um, I'd like to say hello to Karen, uh, Catherine. So welcome. Perfect. So I'm glad that you still have stuff in the ground. Very cool. Um, so before we talk, go into the show on long-term preservation and planting fall garlic, I have a bunch of questions and pretty much they're all from one person um, who had a lot of questions because she couldn't make it tonight, Trish from British Columbia. Um, but before I talk about that, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, some reflections on the natural world. And this is going to kind of roll into going into veganic growing. So let me just make a note on time. So we were very fortunate. We were very privileged to be able to go on a very beautiful, epic road trip um, up through uh, north of Quebec City, um, along the, the Fleuve de Saint Laurent, and around the Fjord de Saguenay, which is the longest fjord in the world. And along the way, there was some very interesting naturalist spots. Now, before I ever became a grower uh, or a homesteader or a gardener, my first passion and my longest passion ever since I've been 23, so 27 years ago, um, was to be is to be a naturalist. I, I I enjoy everything to do with the natural world, the 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 paysage, the, the scenery, the, all the beings that live there, the plants. Um, everything. So whenever I have an opportunity to go on a road trip, I um, pretty much research it before I go to see what kind of natural highlights there might be, whether it's some old growth forest or some special migration of birds or a migration of whales um, or any kind of other um, being out there that I have an opportunity to to be in their space. So I researched this quite heavily before I go. And so what I realized on this particular trip before we left is that we had this opportunity to go to a place called Cap Tourmont. And Cap Tourmont is about 30 minutes, about 30 kilometers north of Quebec City. And it's right on a point going into the Fleuve de Saint Laurent. And what Cap Tourmont is, it is one of the hottest migratory stopover points for Arctic snow geese. So the snow geese, they kind of summer, winter over in 
Virginia, North Carolina out on the Outer Banks. And then in the summertime or in the late spring, they go all the way up to the North Pole and they breed up in the Arctic Circle. They spend their summer there, they have their children, and then they come down and along the way, they stop in a few places. And one of these places is called Capital. Now, it's not just the snow geese that go there, but it's also a lot of other migratory waterfowl because the way the migrations work with birds is that when some, some birds are sort of sparks for other birds to take off. So let's say the snow geese are there and they're getting ready. Um, Trish, I'm glad you came. I'm going to go ahead and answer your questions here in a minute. And so the snow geese, they're flying, they're coming down. And when the snow geese start taking off, the, the, um, the ducks also will go with them, the migratory waterfowl that will, that will also are going to be winter over in places that aren't so cold. So we arrived at Cap Tormon. It's a national wildlife refuge. And we were there about five or six minutes before it opened. So there are other places that you can go, but it's not in the totally protected area. <laughs> I came to find out. So there's a place called Mar uh, there's a there's a marsh there where I noticed that there was quite a few other birders, and then there was this walk that was going down the fluff. So Melanie and I we decided to go down this trail. Didn't say it was closed. Didn't say there was anything weird. We get about two steps in, and all of a sudden we hear a bang bang. And there were gunshots from duck hunters. <laughs> it took me a while to figure this out, but then eventually we saw the snow geese and it was a super amazing scene. I saw 25,000. I took a small video. It was, they were just everywhere. And, but in the distance, you just keep hearing this black, black shotguns shooting at the other migratory waterfowl. And as we were walking through Cap Tormont, we, we, we saw a bunch of signs for Ducks Unlimited that they were a proud supporter of Cap Tormont. And Ducks Unlimited is specifically an organization for hunters. They do do preservation of lands, but for no other reason other than to make sure that the hunters have a place to hunt. Now, I would like to think that Ducks Unlimited has another agenda, that their agenda is actually to uh, protect for the ducks, for the sake of the ducks, but that's not what it's for. It's for the ducks to come with the snow geese and unbeknownst to them, be right in the line of fire. So I was shocked. It shouldn't, it shouldn't shock me, but unfortunately I still get shocked along the way. I find um, Quebec's law is pretty archaic when it comes down to uh, species. Now, uh, what, what uh, really bothered me was the fact that um, every time that there was a gunshot, the snow geese would kind of kind of get startled and they would sort of fly around. So here they created the space for the snow geese to be and the gunshots are disturbing them. And they would know that if they, uh, people would know that who are in power, they would know that if they stay. Anyway, Continuing on, so we got around the fjord, a super beautiful place. We we ended up at Bay, Bay St. Marguerite. We looked for the beluga whales there because the beluga whales, if anybody knows the story of beluga whales from the Fleuve de Saint Laurent, at one point there was over 10,000 beluga whales that traveled up and down the Fleuve de Saint Laurent and went go ahead and breed in the Bay de Tadoussac and in the Fjord de Saguenay or the Saguenay River. They were hunted almost to extinction until 1979. And after that, there was sort of partial protections. And in that partial protections, they realized there was only a thousand left. So there was only a 10, there was only 10% of the original population. They were almost hunted completely to extinction. So the belugas are protected. They live in a place where they're protected. Well, when you drive around the fjord, what you notice is that along the right side of the road, if you're traveling from Saguenay back to Tadoussac, on the right side of the road is the park, but on the left side of the road is this beautiful river, and I never did get the name of it, this absolutely gorgeous river, and basically every two kilometers, there's a spot to stop and fish and kill beings. So if you're a fish and you happen to be in the Fjord de Saguenay, that's actually not true, because even in the Fjord de Saguenay, they fish. They don't hunt the belugas anymore, but they still fish. So this is bringing me around to my point. So as a naturalist, I am someone who believes that we pr should preserve nature for nature. We should preserve beings for beings. 
We shouldn't preserve beings or nature for the sake of humans to go and be dominant, have dominion over those other beings. We should have nature for nature beings to thrive. It's a very simple concept. What's really interesting is along the journey, I actually was reading a, 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 natu a naturalist by the name of Aldo Leopold. He's one of the most famous naturalists uh, right up there with uh, John Muir or Henry David Thoreau um, from the United States and Wisconsin. And, and I'm going to finish my rant just so you know. So Aldo Leopold, he talks very much about speciesism, which is very interesting. He speaks about it in his book. Yet, because he was a man living uh, from the city, but had a, had a sort of a chalet in the country, well, an off-grid chalet in the country, he was a man of his time from the late 1940s who hunted and fished. So the grouse, even though he believed that rabbits should not be killed and moose should not be killed and the ecosystem needs to work together and all beings need to live. Uh, rough grouse weren't a part of that. <laughs> and even though he believed that in the waters, like uh, muskrats should be saved and beavers should be saved and, and river otters should be saved, he doesn't believe trout should be saved because that's what he would take. So here we are in 2022, and after going on this road trip, I realized that our laws are way back to 1940, or maybe even further back to 1900, maybe even further back than that to 1850, where we're still looking the world as the same way. And, 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 and I always think of it the same way. Can't we just look at the world differently? But ultimately, the most beautiful thing about it is when I got to see the belugas in the Tadoussac Bay and, and I saw them every day and there were 15 that were cresting and blowing out of their blowholes and just having a blast. And thankfully, there weren't that many croziers or ferry boats going out there to look for them. And there were, that weren't at, that many private boats going out there to look for them. It, it gives me ultimate hope because no matter what us humans throw at the natural world, those snow geese, they give me hope. No matter what torments cap torment, <laughs> what torments we throw at the natural ecosystems and the beings that live there, they're still surviving. So we still have a chance and we still have time, but it needs to stop. Like all this exploitation of beings needs to stop. So it rolls back into began it growing in our own gardening systems. This is a little piece that we can all personally do in our own space to make sure that all the beings that live here have a place to live, to thrive to be free, to be free to live as they wish. Thank you for listening to me, my little naturalist rant. I can't get over it sometimes. Um, I, I just have to speak about it because it's super important to me, but it does roll into our show. So as I start, since Trish is there, I'm going to go ahead and answer a few of her questions. So I'm going to start with the latest ones first. So alliums, growing leeks. Yeah, so growing leeks is something that we're going to do in the spring early. We're going to go ahead and plant them in uh, trays full of soil. We're going to grow them like little onions. And when they when they get the size of a green onion, then we're going to plant them outside. He, you're in BC, Trish, but here in Quebec, we're going to go ahead and plant those about the second week of May. Now, leeks are interesting because they need about four months to develop once they've been planted. Uh, here we just harvest them. We just harvested them today. And uh, so they've been in the ground, yeah, almost 100 and, 120 days, very close to 120 days. Some of the 110 days, those are the longest leaks. So it's pretty simple. You just need to put up a potting soil. Now they're going to go ahead and sit in those trays for about eight weeks before you plant them outside. So you really want to look at your day length. I would imagine in BC, you could probably get away with planting your leeks the first week of April. I wouldn't plant them any earlier because then you're going to be harvesting your leeks in July. And I don't know the benefit of that for you. In Arizona, I did really the same thing. A lot hotter than it is here in Quebec, a lot drier. And I would go ahead and harvest them at the end of September also. So Leeks, very simple. Plant them like you would green onions, like bulbing onions, exact same way. They're just a little bit longer to develop. You have gray mold in your garlic. Yeah, that's going to happen. When we have garlic that we harvest and it's been kind of wet or it's a very humid environment, you live out on an island, 
it can get in the wrappers and sometimes it can be worse than others. The best thing that you can do is try to keep your soils as dry as possible when they're in their development stage. Obviously you're probably not irrigating, but continuing to amend your soil, maybe even using some dry straw mulch or dry leaf mulch might help with the gray mold problem. Uh, your other question, and I'm going to answer your, your other question later, pizza, beets and mice. Yeah, this year was a really weird year. We have um, moles that uh, ate half of our beets, our very last run of beets. They didn't eat the greens, but they did eat the beets themselves. Maybe it's just something cyclical going around around the world. Maybe they felt like they needed a little extra nourishment. I don't have any solutions for rodents in the garden. I don't have any solutions for the mice or the rats or the voles or the moles in the gardens other than plant as much diversity as possible. It's really all we can do. Eventually the mice will have their babies and they'll move on. Sometimes we end up putting our gardens right where the underground um, moles and, and mice are living. And so of course they're just gonna come up and eat what we planted there because it's easy access. Um, you can go ahead and put a fence around your garden. Um, sometimes that works, put a really small hole fence, depending on where. Uh, I know Ruth Stout used to do this. She used to get mice in her garden. And, but again, I don't do much about it really. I do as many successions as possible. And I do, or we do, excuse me, we do as many successions as possible. So for beets, we succession plant four times because it is sure that there are times in the season where certain critters are more active than others, certain insects or pressures are more abundant than at other times. And the same holds true with weather. Sometimes uh, beets really don't like to be wet, really, really wet after they germinate. Uh, they would like to be able to just kind of grow while it's drier. But if you have a really wet period, then you may have stunted beets. So in the case of beets, in the case of all fruits and vegetables and herbs and flowers, when it comes down to mice, try to plant more diversity. The best I can say, the more diversity out there, the more choice that they're going to have to choose from. It's the best I can tell you about that. And there is no other solution I can have. Um, yeah, so there you go. Everybody kills rodents. I know, working on organic farms, uh, they would trap. They would use the mice trap, especially in the greenhouse. Um, they would let out as many cats as they could let out to go ahead and take care of the take care of the mice problem. So yeah, overplant. And if you have an abundance, great. Chances are pretty good you're going to have some stuff eaten, and that's okay. Um, if it gets really bad, and I've had a year where it was really really bad. Uh, where they ate an entire run of about 75 broccoli and cauliflower plants. I did go ahead and try to fill in their holes. I saw their holes when they were coming out at night. And instead, I just tried to just put some dirt back in their holes just to deter them away from that section. It worked marginally well out of the 75 they ate. I think I still had 50 that came, but... You know, so sometimes you have to be a little bit more proactive, but absolutely, I would never go so far as to kill any being just for me to be fed. It's not going to happen. So, reflections on the natural world. Thank you, thank you, thank you for listening. Say hello to Anne. Thank you all for being there. Okay, long-term preservation. This has been a very interesting deal. I, since we got back from vacation, I decided to post on um, a couple of Facebook sites or Facebook groups that I'm on about homesteading. And I love these homesteading sites because they have all sorts of cool, crazy off-grid ideas about how to do this, how to do that, how to have a composting toilet. And, and me, I'm always looking for low energy. I mean, we, we're on the grid. We do have electricity, but I'm always looking for low energy ways to grow or to um, reuse my own um, my my own bounty or uh, excreted bounty or um, for whatever things, any kind of passive solar I love to think about. So I love to post on these sites and I thought that this was an interesting one because long-term preservation is not something that you hear about or, or, or hear discussed read about discussed in many gardening books because I flat out don't think people know 
how to go ahead and store for the long term. And what I'm talking about here is I'm not talking about canning. We talked about that a few shows ago. I'm not talking about drying. I'm not talking about freezing. Um, I'm talking specifically about keeping produce fresh. Because, yeah, I could go through the, the effort. And this was, okay, so I'll go back. So I threw this out there. And there were some interesting examples. There's a couple of off-grid homesteaders that replied that they can everything. They pressure can everything, even potatoes, beets, carrots, everything, because they don't have a storage capability at this point. I get that. That, that, that makes sense to me. I understand that if you don't have a, 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 a good place to be able to store for the long term, then you're going to want to preserve the harvest in whatever kind of way. And that's just as important. So, but me, I like to eat fresh beets. Canned beets are great, but I love eating fresh beets and I love eating fresh carrots, especially in April and May. And I love potatoes fresh and I love cabbages fresh. So let's, so what I'm talking about here is long-term storage from now, because everything that we have now is in cold storage and will be there until May. So we're talking six to seven months. And me, I find that very, very cool. So we're going to talk about how we're going to do that. We're going to talk about how to do it for every specific kind of crop that we have out there. So let's start with the alliums. So let's talk about garlic, onions, and leeks. Now, onions, onions and leeks are the same. They both want to be stored at anywhere from zero to four degrees, ideally. Now, on this, on the posts and on the feedback, it looks like people were getting some things to stay quite good until March, which is still pretty good. October, November, December, January, February. It's five months um, at 10 degrees Celsius or 50 degrees Fahrenheit. But 10 degrees for me always sparks all of my root veggies to start pushing out roots or pushing up leaves. And yes, Trish, I do have an idea about how to make a root cellar. Um, it will require some work, but I will get into that. I did build one in Arizona and I loved it. So I will tell you about it here in a minute. So garlic, so leeks and onions both want to be stored from zero to zero to four or five degrees. Let's say five degrees max. It'll be just fine. 30 degrees Fahrenheit. But onions, once they're cured, so after you pull them out of the ground, they really want to be dry. Uh, I put them in the sun. Then I put them into a sort of warm storage where they just continue to sort of cure. And then, yeah, they can go in zero to five degrees. But onions, like potatoes, I store completely in, in um, cardboard boxes. You can store them in wooden boxes. It doesn't matter. But what you want is you want the moisture to kind of leach, continue to leach away from the potatoes and onions. There's going to be still a little humidity because there'll be potatoes under, underneath. Uh, there'll be layers of potatoes with potatoes underneath. But you want to have those particular uh, potatoes and onions, you want to have those particular vegetables, root vegetables, have air exposure. They don't want light. They want to be in the dark, but they want air exposure. And everything I'm going to be talking about wants to be in the dark as much as possible. Leeks, on the other hand, do not want to be stored where it can, where there's kind of airflow. They'll dry out too fast. They also don't want to be stored where it's too humid. Otherwise, they'll mold or start growing because leeks don't mind growing. As we know, those of us who haven't har started ha sort of harvest our leeks late, they don't mind living in conditions that are minus two, minus three degrees. So at zero degrees, uh, some humidity, they're going to start putting out their roots. Two degrees are going to start putting out their roots. So the best, the best way to store leeks, and this is going to be leeks, carrots, beets, parsnips, rutabaga, all of your, all of your root vegetables like that, along with the leeks, which is an allium, 
Me, my preferred, if you have accessibility to zero to five degrees, is to put anything sealed, so a Tupperware container sealed in your fridge, or if you have a cold room, put it in your cold room at zero to five degrees, or in a plastic bag, zero to five degrees, no holes in it, in your fridge. It'll store forever. Now, most of these vegetables will store better, will definitely store six to seven months if they're dirty, if you keep the layer of dirt on them. The layer of dirt will help sort of preserve uh, the vegetable on the inside. It sort of acts as an insulation barrier too. If it is, it'll have that, just that little bit of humidity that those crops want, but not too much to get them to start growing or mold. And um, yeah, so all of your, all of those root vegetables should be dirty. That's that in a tote. Now, what's interesting about what these people talked about on the, on the homesteading sites, the, the, probably the most common one that came out was storing them in sand. Uh, so I would imagine this would be construction sand. I never got a definitive answer, but this is what I would think. Construction sand, which is kind of a, it's kind of a sandbox sand. And people would either use these Rubbermaid totes. Um, I'll answer that question. Actually, I'll answer it now. Do, do you store veggies in cold room and containers or cardboard boxes? So in the cardboard boxes, potatoes and onions. In containers, everything else. So leeks, carrots, beets, parsnips, rutabaga, celery root. Cabbages, chicories, celery root, cauliflower, that doesn't go six or seven months, broccoli, winter radishes, turnips, all of those will go in containers. The only two things that go in cardboard boxes or it could be wooden boxes are potatoes and onions in the cold room at zero to five degrees. So I hope that's clear. Um, now I totally forgot what I was talking about, but that's okay because that just brings us to other sections. Oh, sand. Yeah. So sand, I've heard before. I've, I've, I've thought of this idea before. I think you need a lot of sand. This was why I've never used it. But, but if you live in a place where it is, where it does get cold and you have a portion of your home that you can keep colder, even I don't know about 10 degrees, but let's say eight or nine degrees, or maybe you have a basement. Uh, like here we have a sous sole. We have an underground. It's not, it's not uh, finished. It's very difficult to get to. I don't store anything down there, but throughout the winter time, the heater, I have some heaters down there because all my piping is down there and it stays about seven to nine degrees. Now, if you put the root veggies in sand, so carrots, beets, rutabagas, parsnips, if you put them in sand, then they will have that insulation layer. Now, I couldn't also get a definitive. It seemed like one person was relating the information from his father who said he swore by sand. Seemed like it was dry sand. But then somebody else said that you need to keep it quite moist. Now, for me personally, and I'll get to this point about the containers in a minute when we're talking about carrots and beets. Me, if there's any moisture in my containers, my carrots and beets start growing and the rutabagas start growing, the parsnips start growing. And the parsnips and carrots are really interesting because not only do they put up the, do they put up their, their leaves, they also start putting out their roots. And to me, it makes the carrot less tasty. It makes parsnip less tasty. So if I were to do it in sand with water, watered sand, then me, I find that I think everything would start growing in there. Like I think I would start growing carrot plants because carrots don't care if it's four degrees, they'll grow, it doesn't matter. So you wanna keep them in their state of dormancy by keeping them as dry as possible with only that tiniest bit of humidity, which can be kept on by the dirt so that they stay fresh. And that's what the dirt does. It, it keeps them insulated fresh. That should be a word, insulated fresh. I like that. Anyway, so um, that was interesting. Now another gentleman told me that he would just put them in totes in potting soil. Like a like a sand, like a soil from the garden. Well, I think that the same thing would happen. And he actually said that he did it at ten degrees. So again, I think this would work for a while. 
I think maybe it would work for two to three months. And one of the person, one person said that they put it in their garage that was unheated. They live in a place, well, heated slightly. They live in a place where it gets quite cold. Uh, I, I, I'm sorry, I don't catch where. And it got four to nine degrees. Um, and they, she had carrots all the way until March, I would imagine harvesting now. So really, the things you should consider if you're thinking about long-term storage. Now, you need to think about your gardening. You need to think about actually how much you want to store. Now, are you trying to be a homesteader? Are you trying to produce enough root veggies for you and your family for the entire time before you start growing vegetables again? So Melanie and I were two people. We save for ourselves 100 pounds of onions and 100 pounds of potatoes. So we need to have enough room. Now, if I put them in cardboard boxes, and I'm talking heavy-duty cardboard boxes that I get from the grocery store that they sell like pineapples in or something or um, what else, or melons. And 100 pounds is four boxes of each. So you need to have eight boxes, and we're talking three feet long by a foot and a half feet wide. So that's a lot of space. But if you have a place that is nine degrees, preferably five, but I think nine could probably work, then you can go ahead and store all those carrots and onions. Other crops are going to be different. Carrots, they don't, at nine degrees, they're going to start growing. So you need to really think. Long-term storage is about planning for the future. It's about thinking about how you're going to produce enough of certain things, certain crops, so that you have good edibles all the way through those really, really difficult winter months, and especially up here in the north and even in Arizona where I live. I would grow until November, but there was a good three months, four months where I couldn't grow anything. So if I didn't have potatoes and sweet potatoes and carrots and beets, then, you know, what was I, what was I going to eat? Uh, this is very important. So think about your needs. Think about what that is. So just to get back to it. So carrots, we do, we, we, for the two of us, we, we store 50 pounds uh, in kilos, let's say 20, 20, 22 pounds, 22 kilos of, of carrots, 22 kilos of beets, 45 to 50 kilos of winter squash, which I'm going to talk about with garlic in a minute because it's different storage capabilities, different storage needs. Potatoes and onions, 45 kilos. Rutabaga, about 15 to 20 kilos. Parsnips, 5 to 10 kilos. Um, chicories, kind of as much as we can. We love chicories, like green radicchio, red radicchio. Uh, cabbages, um, about 25 to 30 kilos of cabbage. Uh, would Jerusalem artichokes be able to be stored in boxes too? Uh, you know what? I don't think so, because I've stored them in... I've stored Jerusalem artichokes in boxes and they got too dry. So I think Jerusalem artichokes are a little bit different, Catherine. I think Jerusalem artichokes are a little bit more, uh, treat them more a little bit like carrots. Uh, what I have noticed though with Jerusalem artichokes, which I thought is very interesting, usually we don't wash anything before we put in cold storage, but I would have, if I washed Jerusalem artichokes and I put them in a plastic bag and put them in my fridge so you could have quite a bag, it would last you quite some time. Uh, those topping on boards, they last months. They lasted three or four months like that. So no, I would put them in a bin, some sort of a sealed bin. A note on the sealed bins. When I first put the produce in, it is absolutely certain that the produce is going in warmer than the cold room is. So as the temperature fluctuates between the, say, the let's just talk about carrots, the carrots getting to the temperature where they want to go dormant, zero to four degrees, there's a time where they're going to perspire, where they're going to respirate, and it's going to create a lot of humidity in those containers. They need to be wiped out periodically. Um, I will probably, because I have lost, when I first started this whole experience, I think I lost 50, 20 kilos of carrots because I didn't do this and I put it in a bin too large. And I'm going to talk about that in just a minute. 
I put it put it in a bin too large and because I didn't wipe out the excess humidity, eventually all that water just kind of went to the bottom because it was a it's a lot. And the difference in temperature, even if you harvest your carrots, it's 10 degrees outside. The time that it takes and that differential between the 10 degree temperature to the three degree temperature is going to create a lot of moisture and it's settled on the bottom and it created like a little puddle almost like a little pond that those four carrots were sitting in it. And I, I just didn't realize, I didn't know that was in 2016. This never happened again. Um, so I would wipe out the bins, just use a rag, wipe out the bins, wipe out the top, just wipe around the sides. Like if it's packed full, just wipe around the sides. You don't have to dig around, but it is always certain. It is always a possibility too, that when you harvest all those carrots and you do store them dirty, that you're going to have one in there that's rotten. Uh, that you just happened to pull out that wasn't a good storage carrot. So it is also a good idea to look through your carrots, your beets, everything a few times before you put them away and forget about them. So I'll probably wipe out the carrot bins uh, once a week for three weeks. And then after that, I'll open it up. And if there's no moisture on the top, that means that everything is exactly the way it should be. You don't want any more, you don't want any sitting moisture. You want moisture, but you don't want sitting moisture on the lids. Um, and it's really going to happen with anything that you harvest at the time. So Jerusalem artichokes put into a bag, wash them or put them into a bin. And I think that they would do this fine. They can, they can be dirty. Um, that's fine too for Jerusalem artichokes. Just again, wipe out the bins. So when you're wiping out the bins, it's for celery root, chicories, Cabbages is really, really important. I had a dilemma last year that I didn't realize. We had, no, two years ago, we had a huge cabbage harvest. It was so much bigger than I thought. And what I have is like a blue 50-gallon, uh, uh, so 130-liter drum, uh, food-grade drum that I put into my cold room, and that's where I put the cabbages in. And the same thing happened. I, I didn't realize that there was so much humidity from harvesting the cabbages, even though they were harvested quite quite cool during the coldest part of the day that the cabbages perspired and respir and respirated and uh and created humidity problems and i used to, i got mold problems on the leaves that happened a couple of years ago i mean they're still fine you can still peel back but eventually you just have to peel more and more back so cabbages um a farm that i worked at uh, a little bit south of here in Ripon, uh Ripon, quebec he would go ahead and put it at put his cold room at one degree and just put his cabbages kind of in a wooden box, a huge wood. I mean, we're talking thousands of cabbages, but in a wooden box. Now it's sure the ones on the outside of the wooden box, the ones that were sort of more exposed to the air are going to have a few dried out leaves that you just peel away before you get to the nice juicy green interior. But the ones in the middle are going to be just fine. The ones that are sort of down in. So I think that's what his expectation was, is that he was expecting a little bit of loss. Well, for us small gardeners, homesteaders, and small farmers, we don't want any loss if we can help it. So figuring out a different solution. So what I've done with, with cabbages specifically is I put a plastic, just a plastic sheet, an old plastic sheet I had around on the bottom so that the water will collect. It's kind of rumpled, so the water will pool in pockets in some places. Cabbages go, and then I put another plastic sheet over the top. Every now and then I pull the plastic sheet off and I wipe it out. Um... So I'm going to answer the question from Trish, and then I'll answer the question from Peaches and Sugar. How to store sweet potatoes. Now, in Arizona, I grew sweet potatoes. Here, I've been marginally successful only once with sweet potatoes, and so I have a tough time. But sweet potatoes need a level of humidity and do not want to be stored that cold. Otherwise, it will get what's called cold rot. And that's when your sweet potato gets kind of blackened. Uh, on the sweet potato itself. So sweet potatoes want to be cured in a very humid environment, so sort of in a bin, between 65 and 70 degrees Fahrenheit. So let me think about this, 16 to 21 degrees Celsius. Then after that, they want to be stored in not as humid an environment, but not 100% dry either. So this, the way I store them in as Arizona is I use sand and actually the soil is what I used in Arizona because we had sandstone, sand, sandstone sand that we would grow in. So I put that on in a plastic bin, put that on the bottom, and then I kind of stuck the, the sweet potatoes in there. 
and then I put the lid over the top and I and I put them down in my root cellar, which I'm going to talk about now after I answer peaches and sugar. Have you tried starting the cabbages made into sauerkraut? Yes, I have. Um, and we love sauerkraut. We also love kimchi. We do both. But I like to also cook cabbage. I like it in stews. Uh, I don't like sauerkraut stew. I like borscht, but I sometimes I want just cabbage flavor. I love doing Asian sautés with cabbage. So I'm learning, I'm learning how to store cabbages really, really well. I also love red cabbage. Red cabbage and sauerkraut is good. It also makes a really excellent kimchi, but I love red cabbages in my salad. We also like coleslaw. And in the winter time when we don't buy greens, maybe we'll buy some organic kale if we can find it, but we're, we don't buy a lot of greens. We, we're going to eat those cabbages going to eat those uh those those red cabbages and green cabbages in our salads so we want to keep them fresh but i do love sauerkraut it's also very high in vitamin c so to go back to trisha's question how does one build a root cellar or how does one create a space where they can store their roots well the root cellar and that's what I built in Arizona. It was actually my first project, <laughs> one of my first projects. I don't know if you all remember, but there was a phenomenon uh, called Y2K in 1999 that had some of us freaked out. I was one of them. It's actually what really sparked me on my homesteading journey. I, I wanted to store all my own food. I thought for sure that the computers would crash. Anyway, I every now and then I get into this conspiratorial tone, but it gets rarer and rarer these days. Let's put it like that. But so in 1999, I had a magazine called Countryside Magazine, and there were all these like images of um, there were all these images of uh, root cellars, and uh, I decided to start building one. So I dug with a shovel, just like that. Um, in Arizona, the frost line is like it is here. Well, here I think there it was three feet. Um, so I wanted to go below frost line. I wanted to go where the ground was cold. So I dug and dug and dug and dug. Well, now, interestingly, at the time, I was actually working a corporate job for, for a while, for nine years. I was a manager of a rental car company during the week. And then on the weekends, I went to the homestead. That's where I live. But I would go back to the homestead and I would do some sort of project. So this was my weekend project every single weekend from May until remember when I was finally done, October, I think. So I would just go and I'd dig. I'd wake up in the morning, i have my coffee, i have my breakfast, I'd go out and dig, 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 until I got a root cellar down six feet. Now, I because I, we knew we were going to can a lot. I wanted to store flour. I wanted to store sugar. I wanted to store salt. I wanted to store potatoes and sweet potatoes. Um, I wanted to store the carrots and beets. If we ever figured out well how to grow them there. And I wanted to, um, it was just something that I thought was cool. So I dug and dug and dug down, down six feet and two feet was above the ground. And then I roofed it. I had a couple of friends. We put up cement block and created a cement block bunker root cellar and we roofed it and then we covered it with sand. Now it doesn't have to be that elaborate. Um, I have read since then some really interesting there, there are ways to be able to measure on the north side of, say, a rocky slope or on a north side of a mountain. You can measure the temperature by putting in a soil thermometer and see what the soil temperature is all throughout the year. Now, this is a long-term project, so you're going to want to know all throughout the year, especially in the summertime. Now, if you're not storing anything in the summertime, it's not important. But the, the months that are important are October, where it's still warm, and March and April when when the thaws start happening. So you can go ahead and put that soil thermometer in there and see what the soil temperature is and then dig underneath the rocky crevice uh, or into the side of the hill just to create enough space where you could put a makeshift door um, and put in your veggies so that it's sealed. And I think Trish said at some point, um, rodent proof, I have an insulated shed but it's not, not rodent proof. Yeah. So um, if you put them in, if you put 
you're going to need to figure out a system that is that is um, mice and rat proof. It, it's really the only way, unless you want to can. So it goes back to the whole thing again. If you if you don't have all that options, but you can grow a lot of carrots and you can grow a lot of beets, then go ahead and pressure can them. Uh, water bath can them, whatever you want to do to go ahead and store them for as long as you can. That's what I have. So bins for most stuff, if you can, in your fridge, very cold for most things, dirty, possible, always in the dark. Um, I have noticed that for things like beets, you can wash them and they will last just fine. I had, I've had beets that I washed that I kind of forgot about. We started eating the fresh beets. We looked in there and go, oh, there's the beets from last year. Oh, look at that. They're still good. So they lasted a year. <laughs> so the harder the root vegetable, the better. The rutabaga, rutabagas can last almost two. They're so hard. Um, beets can last a long time, like I just said. But cabbages are only going to make it about six or seven months. And as soon as the temperature fluctuates and gets a little warmer, eight, nine degrees, and their dormancy is broken, then they're going to start growing. And uh, then you can start doing, are plastic totes rodent proof? No. So your building needs to be rodent proof because plastic totes are not. I've learned that too, that squirrels will get into the buildings and they will chew through the plastic tote and, and eat what's ever in there, just like what happened with Trish. Um, so if you're looking at long-term preservation, you need to create a situation where only you have access. Fair enough. Fair enough. Okay. So let me make a note on time as we move on. Oh, I didn't start time, but I think I know the start time. So 46 minutes, 13 minutes. I won't be able to dig that or pay to have it dug. Maybe I'll just use the shed. I don't do a lot of canning. We are in earthquake areas. So I think storing, not canning, best dehydrate a little. Yeah. If you're, let me think about that, but use the shed try to think about certain maybe you can build a wooden box a pretty large wooden box and put your totes in there for storage and then close a wooden box um but you do want to keep it in a plat in a, in a rubber made container something like that or some sort of a like a large tupperware container as i would say but see if you have enough ability or find someone that can build you a large wooden box. It really doesn't have to be that elaborate, but just enough so that the mice can't get through. Maybe that's an option. Just an option. I don't know, but as I'm thinking about it, that's what I came up with, with a with a lid that only you, again, that you can open. Uh, welcome, Nancy Love. It's always a pleasure to have you. Doesn't matter whether you're late, on time, it's all good. Okay, so planting, fall garlic, and bed preparation. So garlic is one of the longest crops in the ground that we will grow in our northern climate. So we're going to go ahead and plant that like most people in northern climates here in the next two to three to four weeks. And we're not going to harvest that crop again until July. So there's some specific things that we want to look for. First of all, seed. We want to make sure that our seed is completely free of any disease. So one of Trisha's question is, um, I had gray mold in my garlic. So the gray mold, that, that garlic won't want to be used for seed. You would want to go ahead and use seed garlic that is free of any blemish, any kind of uh, rot uh, at all. And if you don't, what's going to end up happening is then the next bulb is going to have it. Some won't, but most will. I've had this happen with my music garlic. This happened a few years ago back. So you start with good seed. Hopefully it's your own. If not, buy some from a reliable source and then save it. And it's really easy to save it. You just need to cure it, make sure it's dry and then in October plant it. Um, don't worry too much, just, just take a look at it all. Peel it back until you get to the cloves and see how the cloves look. You can always just store the cloves from the bulb. Don't throw away your garlic just yet. 
let's talk about preparing the beds first and then we'll talk about how we plan it. So bed preparation of garlic. Um, a garlic seed bed really should be clean and it should be clear of the native flora. It should be basically nice and as fluffy as you can make it. But even if you have clay soil, it's not a problem. You can still grow garlic. The secret to garlic is when you push it in, when you push the little garlic clove in, uh, say it is one inch, so 2.5 centimeters. It wants to go down now, depending on how cold you are. I've We've pushed it down as far as three times that. The general rule is two times. But three times, I think, is even better. Because for he, here, where it freezes a lot, obviously you're not planting garlic before frost line. There are frost heaps that come, and it's going to continue to push up and push up. And sometimes you have the thaw and the, the, the thaw and the, the freeze and the thaw and the freeze or the degel and the freeze and the gel and the, and the gel. So you want to make sure that that garlic is deep enough so that it doesn't push to the top because if it does push to the top, it may get damaged from the freeze. There are ways to mitigate that too. Garlic does not want, like to be planted in places where it stays wet all the time. It does want to be well-draining. It doesn't mean your soil needs to be relatively well-draining. You just don't want to ever plant your garlic, if possible, on a slope where the water pools. Clay soil is not a problem. Water pooling is a big problem. In the wintertime, it's not a problem. It's still sitting in a state of dormancy. It might have tried to put out a few roots, but it's just really just sitting there waiting. It's really in the springtime where the water wants to drain away from the garlic. So when you're thinking about your bed preparation, you want to think of that. Take a, take a site where the water drains away. Good veganic compost is great. If you don't, native soil can work fine. The secret is to make sure that your pH is between 5.5 and 7.5, which is really interesting. Garlic is a crop that really doesn't mind an acid soil and really doesn't mind an, an alkaline soil. But any lower than 5.5 and really any higher than 7.5 and you're just not going to get garlic bulbing the way that you would want. Maybe you'll get little bulbs, but you're not going to get nice big bulbs. Adjust your pH if it's too, too low by adding wood ash. And wood ash will actually give um, some of the nutrients that, some of the nutrients like manganese, like calcium, that will help with the formation of the bulb and help in cell wall development and help with root development. So works for all worlds. So if you live in a place where you have a wood stove, put your wood ash for your garlic. They love it. Garlic wants full sun as much as possible. When I grew in Arizona, I got up to 110 degrees. So what, almost 50, 50 or 47 Celsius? Does not mind, does not care. Garlic loves it, loves it hot, hot, hot. And it likes it cold, cool, 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 like we had in Quebec this summer. So doesn't matter. To mulch or not, <clears throat> in Arizona, I didn't mulch at all. I probably should have. Here I mulch. Sometimes I probably shouldn't. So it really comes up to individual preference. I will always mulch because I love putting straw mulch or dry leaf mulch on my garlic because of that frost heaving that I was talking about. It just gives that extra little bit of insulation um, to protect that garlic. And then when the snows come, then you don't have to worry about it because then the snow acts as the insulating layer. But sometimes it gets really cold and there is no snow and that's when we have trouble. And I like to have that, that mulch layer there. The secret of mulch after it, after you're using it, and I've talked about this in other shows, you just need to task away the mulch a little bit. You need to go and take out some native flora around your garlic. It really doesn't like competition. It won't grow to full size if there is a lot of competition. Uh, so again, to plant your seed garlic, if, you're, if your garlic clove is say 2.5 centimeters, you can plant it down 7.5 centimeters. Where you live, Trish, just double is fine. Just make sure there's equidistant amount between the bulb and the earth. So if your bulb is 2.5 centimeters or one inch, put it down 2.5 centimeters. So there's still 2.5 centimeters above the garlic. There you go. When you're putting in your garlic, it should be easy enough to push in. The problems that I've had with, say, rots and not enough drainage is when I've pushed the garlic in, and I usually just push it down with my two fingers, if I push it in and it goes, 
and it doesn't go down far enough and I sort of have to mound the dirt, then I know that the ground hasn't been prepared in the right way, hasn't been prepared well enough. So if you have a hoe that works, uh, we use a four-prong grat, a four-prong um, hoe that we grat the soil. And we also use a, a, a grillionette, which is a broad fork that, that pushes holes down 12 inches. But probably my, my guess is most of your garden soils out there are a lot less clay than mine. And maybe it's uh, nice and fluffy or loose anyway. But putting that extra layer of compost, maybe 2.5 centimeters, one inch where your garlic is going to go is great. Now, how far apart? Um, I've used all sorts of different methods, tried all sorts of different ways to figure out what, as soon as the garlic roots sort of touch each other, they're going to stop unless you have a really, really, really sandy soil. So if you have a more clay or a clay loam soil like we have in certain parts of our field, the distance that I have found that works the best is uh, 10 centimeters by 15 centimeters. So if I was just doing it myself, I put 15 centimeters all the way around. You can plant in a spiral, you can plant in rows, you can plant in patches. It really doesn't matter how you plant it. Just really the secret is 15 centimeters. So does that make sense? Like that. There we go. About 15 centimeters. If it's 10, it's okay. 15, probably a little better. The, 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 more, the, the, the more the space, the bigger the garlic. If you live in places where it's humid, very humid, I have found that a little bit smaller garlic tends to cure better, store longer than bigger garlic. Um, you can just get it drier faster, especially if you're trying to dry it in a place where, again, it's humid. Um, and when to plant. So you should plant two to three weeks before your ground freezes hard. Obviously, you can't put your garlic in when the, the ground is too frozen. So here we're going to plant the week of the, of the, let's see, let me think about this. Today's the 6th, the week of the 20th, the week of the next show. That's when we're going to plant our garlic, usually when we plant it. Sometimes it can get a little warmer in November, but the, but the nights are still staying pretty cold. So whenever you know that your ground is really, really hard, that's uh, two to three weeks before that. And that's it. That's what I have on planting fall garlic. It's such a joy. You know, there's places in the world where they don't, they can't grow garlic because they don't have a dormant period or they just grow spring garlic. In California, they grow a lot of garlic, but it's not, not the same system. They plant in January, um, sort of sort of tricking trick dormancy the garlic in the fridge before they plant so then it will sprout right away they're soft neck garlic so it's very very neat that we can do that all right so next show very very cool first of all it's the last one i can't believe this it'll be october 20th two weeks from tonight Number 18, we've made it. So thank you to you all. There's people out there who've been there since the beginning. Peaches and Sugar, Trish, Nancy, Love. I think you only missed a couple. Catherine also. Anne from St. Lazar. Um, Megan's not here with us or Jude, but they've been with us for quite some time. So we made it all the way through. This is really cool. So this show, this next show is really all about you. I mean, all these shows are really all about you. I hope you get that by now. It's not really what I have to say. It's, it's about you. It's about making you better growers. It's about what you're experiencing in your, in, your, in your growing spaces. So what have you learned? What new discoveries have you found? What new creatures have you seen in your gardens that you've never seen before? What trials and vegetables worked? Uh, what like sort of old mainstays didn't, old reliable crops didn't work this year. These are the things I want to know. So post it here on YouTube or send me a Facebook message or post it to my timeline when I post the show next week. Tell me your reflections from your observation logs that we talked all the way back in week one that hopefully everybody jotted down, made notes about what their season was. Even me, every year it's the same. This is my... 25th year growing my own food and I've learned more I, I've learned more things and I keep learning and this is 
probably for me, it's like being a naturalist. For me, this is probably the greatest thing in the world about being a grower, being a gardener, being a homesteader, even more than being a small farmer. I mean, it's, that's the job part of it. But being a grower and being a homesteader is that I'm always evolving. With the soil underneath my feet, I'm always evolving. On that note, I think that's all that needs to be said. So thank you all. This has been great. Always is great. Peace. And until I see you again, have a great couple of weeks. Good night.